Can you believe it's Christmas season? I know, uh, officially, like not in the, the modern Christmas season that started at Halloween, but this is the real Christmas season. And uh, I can't believe how fast it has gone. And um, as we were thinking about what we could be doing for the Christmas uh, season, one of the things that came to mind was um, the story before the story that Jesus was prophesied about hundreds and hundreds of years, but the way prophecy works, nobody was sure what he was going to look like, what his life was going to be like. And I thought it would be really fun to go back and look. I mean, we couldn't do them all because that would be like a year series. But to pick a couple of them and, and look at them, I thought would be a really fun time. And so um, hopefully, if it's not fun, I apologize now, but I'm having a great time with it. And I hope that, you know, you will with me. Um, some of us have grown up in church. You know, and so the story of Christmas seems normal. It seems, you know, it's just been part of your life forever. It's easy to believe. But others haven't grown up with the story of Christmas, uh, the story of Jesus as much as they have um, some of the other stories that go along with Christmas. And, you know, maybe you have grown up thinking as Christmas uh, like more of a fairy tale then what many in here would say, no, 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 it was historical, it really happened. And, but maybe you grew up not knowing that story, and it doesn't feel as, as normal, and so you have doubts. Maybe it's a little hard to believe in this virgin birth. You know, maybe, maybe the, the miracle, such as the Immaculate Conception, was made up by those early disciples to get people to believe. And, you know, I think those are good questions. That. I don't know, maybe it's because I didn't grow up in church when I was a kid, or when I became a follower of Christ in high school, I had a youth pastor who just really encouraged me to ask hard questions, and so I've always been somebody who seeks out the real story, you know? I, I, I don't want to believe stuff just because it's what I've been taught. I, it's just the way it drove my mom crazy, because I was always questioning everything, and, um, but I, I want to believe because I'm convinced it's true, and so uh, thankfully to me, that when it comes to God, he wants us to have faith, which is trusting, but he doesn't want us to have blind faith. This is something I was shocked when I grew up and, and realized that, how surprising, but it's true. God, he doesn't ask us to have faith in him for no reason. He always has provided reasons to trust him, always, and it's still the same way today. And um, for the early Israelites, think about it. What did, why would they trust in the Lord, Yahweh? Well, um, when they were rescued from Egypt, that was pretty amazing because people don't usually get rescued from slavery in a, in a country back in that day. Was that 2000 BC or something? Uh, 1500 BC. Um, the Red Sea parted. That's pretty good evidence. I mean, you know, you look at that and you go, why should we believe? I don't know, but is that a whale? You know, <laughs> things like that are good reasons. Um, food showing up in the desert. These are good reasons to believe. And so when God said, you know, follow me, believe me, it was like, see, I'm with you. See, b there's reasons to believe me. Later in Jewish history, you know, acts was floated or they won impossible battles. There were jars of oil that didn't run out, that kind of stuff. But see, as time went on, it was another powerful evidence that God was with his people and could be trusted. And that was something called prophecy. See, if I went around the room right now and asked everybody to define what they thought the word prophecy meant, I bet a lot of people in here would say it's foretelling the future, which is undoubtedly part of what prophecy is. But that, it, that's not all of it. I mean, prophecy was so much more complicated than that because a prophet was not a fortune teller. He couldn't just like look into the future, you know, put the turban on and go, this is what's going to happen. In, in fact... They, they couldn't foresee the future. A prophet was a, a spokesman of God. Half the time when they prophesied about the future, they didn't even know what it was going to look like. I mean, they were, they, they were taking a message from God. They were sharing this message from God. And then sometimes they didn't even know what the future was going to look like because how that prophecy turned out often was, it was only clear on the other side looking back. And you go, oh, how could we miss that? But in the moment, looking forward, you're like, well, this is, what I, this is what God told me to say. And everybody's going, what is that going to look like? And there was, there was a lot of confusion. Now, 
before we jump into the, the actual scripture for today, you had a prophet who was a spokesman for God. And if any of you like late night TV, you hear all the time people say, I'm speaking for God. So how did they know what a true prophet from a false one? This is where future prophecy came into play often. Because if a prophet's messages about the future came true, he, he could be trusted. But if they didn't come true, what happened? Sometimes they were killed. I mean, it was like you did not mess around being a prophet. If you said, I, I am a spokesman for God, everything you say better be right on. So, as we jump in, let me just give you kind of a key to understanding prophecy. Um, especially Old Testament prophecy. Because like all of Scripture, understanding a prophet's message, first, you ha- to understand it, you have to first look at what that meant to the original audience. That's like all of Scripture. Every time the Scripture says something, you need to ask yourself first, what did this mean to the people it was spoken to? Before you try to figure out what it means for you. And it's the same way, because it was always God's message to the person or the group being spoken to. And sometimes a future meaning was never understood. They just didn't even, they didn't even think that the prophecy was about the future. It's, it's only sometimes hundreds of years later when you would look back, you'd go, the scribes and the teachers would go, oh, that was prophecy about the future. I mean, because it had such a strong original message, they didn't think it was for the future as well. And then something would happen and it would be way beyond coincidence. And they'd go, this was a message for them and for us. So it, it always was like a, two, two meanings, now when it was spoken and for the future. And um, so I just say all that because it helps you understand as we look at what we're going to, at the prophecy about Jesus today, you're going to realize, wow, this thing had a strong message for the time. And that message speaks to the, us so much. The message of the, the original message of the prophet is so relatable to us. That, that's why I wanted to share that, um, because very often, prophecy shows us that there's more to the story. I mean, yes, it had a message back then, but there's, in the midst of all of the chaos, God's working in history. In the midst of all of the dumb things that people do, God is working in the midst of all of that, moving his people towards something bigger than what we can normally see. So as we, we look at some of these prophecies about Jesus, we need to look and see what they normally meant. So let's, let's look at the first one. We're going to look at a famous passage of Scripture today. And this is out of Isaiah 7. And this is what it says. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now this prophecy was spoken 700 years before Jesus was born. 700. It's like 735 BC or something like that, that, that this prophecy was shared. And Matthew, the, the Gospel of Matthew, takes this passage and kind of shows that Jesus was the, was the fulfillment. In Matthew, this prophecy, he, it says, All this took place, this is Matthew, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, If you're like me, some questions come to mind about these these passages. Because, first of all, I don't remember Jesus ever being called Emmanuel. Do you? I mean, his name's what? Jesus. (laughs) Not Emmanuel. So what's up with this? See, Emmanuel means God with us. Does, Does anybody know what the word Jesus or Joshua, same name in Hebrew, means? God saves. Yeah. God saves. Now, the reason that you wonder, okay, is it a real prophecy if Jesus was never called Emmanuel? It's just because in names in America means so much different in, in, you know, in Western society than they did back then. Because a name back in the ancient times was, was kind of like the character of a person. And names could change and somebody could be called several names. Think about in the New Testament. Peter was also called Cephas, was also called Simon. It, Paul was named Saul. Abram changed to Abraham. It was kind of like names were very different because they kind of, you, you could be given several names based upon certain characteristics. And so for, for um, 
Jesus, Jesus means God saves. And that's kind of like what he does. Jesus, his name represents what he does. God saves. But Emmanuel is more of a description about who he is. Who is Jesus? God with us. So that one, that one's a little easy just because names, you can't put the way we think of names on them and, and it works. But another question that came to my mind was, every time I've ever sang the song, the Christmas song, Emmanuel, or every time I've seen it, it always starts with an E. Anybody else wonder about that? Why is Emmanuel an I, but all the songs say E? Are we, what's going on? And that one's also not too bad because in the original language in Hebrew, Emmanuel, I even looked it up this morning to make sure I wasn't crazy. There's, there's no vowels in Hebrew. So we have no idea because the first letter is a silent letter. The second letter is like an M. So you go, is it Emmanuel or Emmanuel? Nobody knows. So if you love the I, put an I and if you love the E, we could have competitions between I's and E's. You know, it doesn't matter because in the original language, they didn't write the vowels. They said them, but they didn't write them. So that's why it's like that. Okay, so those are like the little questions. But there is a big question that I want you to think about. Because when in the, in the original, in Isaiah 7, when it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. When the, the original readers read this, and, and for the next you know, centuries until Jesus, were the Jewish people looking forward to a Messiah that would be born of a virgin? I want you to think about this question. Did the Jewish people, ex- they were looking forward to a Messiah for sure, but were they expecting him to be born of a virgin? And the answer is no, not even close. They weren't, that was such a surprise that they were shocked. They didn't know that this passage was going to be about the Messiah. In fact, I was reading through some Jewish stuff because that's what I do, you know. Um, it's a, like ancient Jewish literature and stuff. This verse was not considered, it was not, they didn't look at this as a messianic passage. They, uh, they struggled with it because of some things we'll talk about in a minute, but they didn't think of this as prophecy. And here's why. Let's look at the next two verses, because, you know, the original message. This passage continues in verse 15. He, the, the person born of the virgin, will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread, which was the northern kingdom of Israel and Damascus, will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim, which is Israel, broke away from Judah, and he will bring the king of Assyria. They didn't separate 14, 15, and 16. They saw this, you know, of course they did as one passage. And you're like, well, what in the world is that saying? I mean, what? That doesn't sound like Messiah at all. It sounds more like a a, a war. (laughs) What's going on? And um, so I wanted to give you a little bit about this because this prophecy was spoken to King Ahaz of Judah in 735 B.C. Now, for those of you, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but after King David, I mean, amazing King David, David and Goliath King David, you know, I mean, this is like, he is the, a picture of a king that has, you know, lived on forever. His son Solomon was a, a, the wisest man who ever lived. But after Solomon, there was a huge fight and the kingdom divided. And so um, we have, you know, and I just put it up here so you can see, but 10 tribes, there was 12 tribes of Israel, 10 of them parted ways and said, we are not following David's king anymore. And they went to, and they called themselves Israel or Ephraim after their biggest tribe. And then Judah, the last two tribes, said, no, we're going to continue following David's line of secession, the kings. And so you had Judah and Benjamin, and Judah was the larger tribe. And so they named themselves Judah. So you have these two kingdoms who, for the rest of history, basically, until they were destroyed, did their own thing. And it was a lot like the American Civil War because, yeah, they were brothers, 
but they fought like crazy. They went to war all the time. S- sometimes they would join together, but, but often they would be on opposite sides. And so it was not a very good relationship between the two. And during that time, there was another, co- another kingdom rising to power. It was called Assyria. And so you can see how big Assyria is compared to little Israel and Judah. And Assyria started just messing with everybody. They, they started um, making cunt all of the different kingdoms pay them money so that they wouldn't attack them. And so they had all of this money coming in from all of these different countries just to keep Assyria off their back. Well, what happened is that the kingdom of Israel, their king, and the king of another kingdom called Damascus were sick of it. They didn't want to pay any more money. And so they said, we're going to rebel against Assyria. Hey, Ahaz and Judah, are you going to join us? And Ahaz knew about the Assyrians, and they were wicked people. And they would kill people so grossly that, I mean, it it caused fear in everybody. And so Ahaz was like, no, thank you. I'm not going to join. And Israel knew they needed Judah's power to be a part of fight. I mean, you look at it and go, I don't think Judah's going to help much in fighting against Assyria. But they decided they were going to kill King Ahaz, put one of their own kings in place, and make Judah join them as they fought Assyria. And this is the whole point of the prophecy. When Ahaz heard that, he was, they were thinking of killing him. And they were thinking of taking over his kingdom. He was scared to death. So scared that he decided, I'm going to go to the king of Assyria and, and basically offer my whole kingdom to him and say, will you save us? Basically, will you save my life? So that was the plan when Isaiah goes to King Ahaz with this prophecy. So now with that background, you see... So Isaiah goes to Ahaz and says, Ahaz, the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. See, what, when, when Isaiah went to Ahaz, Ahaz was a bad king. He was not a God-fearing man. In fact, he tried to get the whole kingdom to go against the Lord and worship other idols and stuff. And so Isaiah said to King Ahaz, Ask God for a sign. He has a message for you. And Ahaz goes, I'm not going to have a sign. I'm not going to ask God for a sign. I don't want to like, go against him. And, um, but he, he, just, he wasn't a believer in God. And so God says, okay, I'll give you a sign anyway. And this is what's going to happen. A virgin, or in Hebrew, it's a tough word, virgin or young woman. But we'll get to that in a minute. A virgin or a young woman will conceive a baby named Emmanuel. God with us. And what will happen after that? You can see in orange, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Ahaz, Israel and Damascus, they are not going to attack you. In fact, they're going to be destroyed by Assyria. You know what Ahaz did when he heard that message? Because you think he'd be excited. Yes, you know, they're coming to kill me. uh, And you're telling me uh, it's not going to happen that Assyria is going to take him out. What does he do? He doesn't believe. And he goes to the Assyrian king. And he becomes completely sub- submissive to Assyria. Um, and Israel and Damascus were completely wiped out. So Judah now had no power. So he didn't believe. But he was given a sign. What did that sign mean? The word virgin, which I'll go back, such a weird word in Hebrew. This was not a normal word that you would use. It was not common if you were talk, it, it meant a woman of marrying age, which in that day especially you would assume was a virgin, but it didn't have to be because a woman who got married and was of marrying age could also be considered this word. But it was a really strange one that, that wasn't necessary because there's other words that they would have normally used, whether it be virgin, like no doubt, or whether it be uh, a married woman or a woman, there's normal words, but this one, this one gave everybody some problems. It was so weird that hundreds of years later, when Israel and Judah had been conquered and the whole world started speaking Greek around, you know, Alexander the Great's time, when they translated the Jewish scriptures into Greek, they translated the word virgin. They didn't translate it young woman of marrying age because everybody's like, this, this is a strange word. It's just not common. So for Ahaz, the point of the message was that a woman was going to have a baby, and this was going to be a sign. And though things looked bleak, Ahab said, I don't care. 
and he didn't believe. But what about us? What about the, the, the next, you know, the bunch of centuries after? The Jewish scribes, the teachers, they would read this, this passage and go, what does it mean? I mean, there's something about it that they couldn't figure out. And then what happens? You have Matthew come along. And he writes these words. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew comes along and he he writes these words and he goes, fellow Jews, the question has been answered. You've been wondering about this passage, but it really meant virgin. A virgin has conceived. A baby was born of a human mother. Yet God was the Father, not through sexual means or anything, because that would be a really Greek way. That's what you know, they thought about all the time. But he's like, no, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And this baby that was born in Bethlehem is a sign to us. What is it a sign of? Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. It was like all of these 700 years, nobody knew what this meant. But then in Jesus, you go, Oh, I get it. It's when we saw Jesus, when they saw Jesus, they could go 700 years earlier. There was this this prophecy that nobody knew it was going to be about the Messiah. And boom, it is. And it's a sign to us and to the world that God is with us. And on that very first morning, you know, when Jesus was born and he was laid in that dirty manger where cows and horses drink out of, that moment everything changed. And it was truly a sign that God was doing something remarkably different. Something had happened. Because for hundreds of years, Israel was destroyed, Judah was was exiled, and they brought back, and they always wanted to be their own nation again, and they never, it, it just did not happen. You know, Alexander the Great took over everything, and then for a little bit of time, there was, there was a moment where it looked like the Jews might get their own country back, but they, it didn't last, and it seemed like the prophets were gone and God was silent. What was going on? And in the, after hundreds of years of silence, all of a sudden, Emmanuel, God is with us. He is no longer distant. He is truly in our midst. God could now be touched. He could be kissed. My favorite Christmas song is Mary, Did You Know? I love this song because Mary... Did you know that when you, you kissed that little baby, you kissed the face of God? And as Jesus grew, he could teach us how to follow God and know him. And who would have ever dreamed that he would provide the means by which we could know God? So, but in this prophecy, I think what is so powerful about this message is that God chooses to be with us. Here's where I want you to think about with King Ahaz and the reason I told you the whole story. King Ahaz was not a God-fearing king. He was not. He had, he and, and he had rebelled against God and he had caused, he didn't just abandon Yahweh, he caused the whole country to abandon Yahweh. He led them in worshiping idols, which for them was the biggest no-no possible. I mean, you can, you can do a lot of sinful things, but don't worship idols. That's like, that's as bad, that's commandment number one. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have no other gods before me. Number one. But not only had he abandoned God, he had abandoned his heritage. Ahaz was of the line of David. David. I mean, a king after God's own heart. This was the promised Messiah was going to come through the line of David. And Ahaz is that line. So he had abandoned everything that he had been taught or that had been, was expected of him. I mean, the descendants of Abraham, Moses, and David, basically the country of Israel had now become no different than the Assyrians. They were just a pagan land. But did God abandon Ahaz? Because this is where it gets good. Ahaz had abandoned God, but did God abandon him? No way. I mean, God goes to Ahaz in the midst of a crisis, his biggest fear. He, his life is in jeopardy, and he says, Emmanuel, I am with you. Emmanuel. 
It didn't matter what Ahaz had done. It didn't matter how, how far he had fallen. It didn't matter what kind of man that he had become. God went to Ahaz and invited him back. See, that's the message of Jesus. That's the message of Emmanuel. Prostitutes were invited to follow him. Tax collectors were invited to follow him. Roman guards who were persecuting the Jews were invited to follow him. Pharisees were invited to follow him. It was their choice. But who stood before them? Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, God in the flesh. 700-year-old promise had been fulfilled. The virgin has conceived and a son has been born. God with us. Okay, every time I think about a message, I always think, so what? Who cares? Why does this matter to us? And I think it matters because it's the same message to us that God gave Ahaz. Have you rebelled against what you know is right? Of course you have. So have I. We're, we're, all, we're all messed up and broken. We, we want to do this, but we do this. And it, it happens constantly in our lives. Have you, have you ever done things that you just knew you'd never do? I mean, you're like, I will never go that far, and you did. H- have you become somebody that you never thought you would become? Have you become a kind of person that you're like, man, if, if everybody else knew what kind of person I was, they would just reject me and hate me. And you know, many of us would say yes to that. We're all glad that nobody is looking, at, you know, reading our mail and finding out what we're doing. And you know what God's message is to us? Is it, is it deal with it? You're on your own. Deal with the consequences? No way. God's message to us is Emmanuel. God with us. You can choose to follow him or you can choose to walk away like Ahaz did. And Judah paid for it. They lost all their freedom. I mean, it wasn't just Ahaz. It was all of the, the whole country of Judah lost their freedom and they had to pay ridiculous amounts of money and they suffered deeply because of Ahaz's unbelief. It was his choice. But the invitation was, you can come back. You can come back. The prophets, Isaiah was one of the early prophets. Forever, all of the prophets, the message was the same. Turn back. God is inviting you back. And that is the message he has for you and me. He is with us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to fill our life with hope, life, and love. But it's our choice. It's our choice. Are we going to be Ahaz? Or are we going to be like Matthew? who was a tax collector, who turned to Jesus when Jesus invited him, and he said, okay, my life is yours. Which one do we choose? We can choose to follow or not. He is Emmanuel. Jesus died on that cross to make us right with God. In a minute, we're going to take communion. And uh, that is a, a remembrance of God's becoming a man and sacrificing to make us right with him. But before we do that, I think it would... The best thing that we could do is say, God, you are with us. You are with me. I choose to be with you. So whatever, would you just bow your heads with me? Let's pray together. If you have chosen to follow Jesus in the past, would you just reaffirm that commitment during this prayer? But there might be people in this room who, you know, maybe you've heard this story over and over, but it never became real. But God right now is is inviting you to walk with him. He wants to do something so impactful in your life and through your life. He wants to offer you life. Would you say yes to him? Maybe you did that a long time ago and then walked, you know, turned and did your own thing for years. Once again, he doesn't, it doesn't matter how far you've gone or what you've become. He's inviting you to follow him. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, even as I was preparing this message, I knew that I continually choose to walk my own way. But as I see this prophecy and I see what Jesus, he did, you did, I realize that you have not abandoned me. You walk with me. You continually invite me to walk with you. So Lord, for all of us in this room, help us. Help us to turn away from our selfishness and our our, our own desires. Help us to follow you. Help us to to choose to walk with you the way you have chosen to walk with us. God, I pray that you give us life and hope.
We need you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.